This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They I felt, felt I really right. Right. I was so And I just thought, well, I figured it, out. I it was that tall. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. This week's story is from me and Christ. The story was recorded in November 2012 at the Jerome L. Green Space in New York City as part of a partnership with Studio 360. The theme of the event was memory. So, I used to do some babysitting. And uh, there was one day I was going to pick up this little girl and her sister. And we're driving home, and she's sitting next to me in the car. And she's very quiet, and this is not like her. And so I say, Emily, is there something wrong? Are you okay? And she looks very serious, and she's very quiet. And she says, can I ask you a question? I'm like, yeah, you can ask me a question. You know, what's your question? And she says, I'm really worried about growing up. What if I forget who I am right now? And I'm like, oh my God, I know. I think about this all the time. And I'm just like, I want to pull the car over and crack open a beer and just like get into this with her. And she's in first grade, so I don't. Um, And instead I say, well, maybe the only way to really remember who you are right now is just to really pay attention. So what does the breeze feel like coming in the window against your face? And what does the sun feel like on your arm right there? And and what does the leather feel like on the backs of your knees? And we do this for a little while, and then we're just quiet, paying attention. And this happened right around the same time that I'd been thinking about this idea of forgetting who you are, because I'd found a bunch of old journals in my parents' home. Um, I was cleaning out my old childhood bedroom in their home, and... I was supposed to be either throwing things away or packing them up for storage, but I discovered I couldn't throw any of it away because I'm going through these trinkets and these papers, and I I saved a crazy amount of of, of stuff. There's boxes and boxes and boxes worth of this stuff, and I just couldn't get rid of it because everything is bringing back memories, and I'm having these emotions, and I'm afraid if I get rid of this stuff, I'll forget. And... I realized that I started saving all of these things and becoming nervous about forgetting when I was like 10 or 11, maybe, which was right around the time that my mother fell and hit her head. So we were ice skating in Yosemite, and she slipped on the ice and fell backward and hit the back of her head. And afterwards, she had trouble remembering things. And she had trouble following the flow of conversation, Her voice slowed down for a while. Um, She had trouble with attention. She she would have these dizzy spells. She started getting migraines, which she'd never had before, and she would disappear for hours into her room. Um, She stopped driving for a while, and then when she started driving again, um, I remember she started being really late to pick me up from school, and I remember sitting on this sort of chipped yellow curb in front of the gym at school, watching all the other kids get into their parents' cars or get on the bus and go home, and just wishing that the next car that would come around the corner would be hers and just wishing it would be hers. And sometimes I was there until it was almost getting dark. Um, But she had good days and she had bad days. So sometimes she would be on time to pick me up. She was witty and charming, just like her old self. And and then on these other days, she seemed confused and distracted, like she was just one step behind everyone else, sort of struggling to catch up. And at the time, this worried me, but I was a child. I figured it was adult, an adult problem that would have adult solutions and that they were handling it. Um, so I'm thinking about all of this while I'm 
looking at these journals, and mostly they're full of very predictable sort of adolescent things, which is not surprising to me. Um, but what was surprising was that they don't mention my mother once. Not once. There's nothing about her. And I have this sort of moment of terror where I feel like she's missing from my collection. And maybe there's this big hole in my memory where she's supposed to be. So I really wanted to talk to her about this, but it took me about a year and a half to work up the courage to say anything to her because my family's very open. We talk about everything. We're very close. There's just this is the one thing we don't talk about. Um, and I remember I was downstairs in the hallway at their house. I think I was home for Christmas. And uh, I asked her, you know, I said, Mom, would you talk to me about your brain injury? And she sort of paused and said, um, I'll think about it. And then we spent three days pretending that we had not had that conversation. <laughs> we went about our business, we read presents, we had breakfast, we did everything else but talk about it. And then she came to me one afternoon and said, okay, I'll talk to you about my brain injury. And she also said, you know, in all these years, you're the only one who's ever asked me about it. And that kind of broke my heart. Um, so we went downstairs and she shut the door to her bedroom and we talked. And she started telling me all of these things I did not know about, all of these symptoms that I had never seen. Um, and she said for her the most difficult things had to do with her memory. So she couldn't remember anything new, she couldn't learn anything new. If she met a new person, she couldn't remember their name. Um, we got a new computer and it took her like five years to figure out how to turn it on because she just couldn't remember the order of the switches. Um, and she said that every time she walked over a threshold from inside to outside or from one room into another, she would have no idea where she was and what she was doing. So she actually put a chair uh, in, in the, next to the door between the kitchen and the dining room in our house because she was going through that doorway so many times. She would go through, forget where she was, what she was doing, sit down in the chair that she had placed there and try and figure out what was going on. And she said there was a... Um, a lamp that we had above our dining room table that had flamingos etched in glass. And she would look up at that lamp and think, I have a lamp like that. And then she would think, that is my lamp. This is my dining room. And that was sort of how she would figure out where she was and she'd carry on with her day. Um, and something similar would happen when she was driving. Every time the car would stop on that sort of settle sensation, when the car really stops, she would have no idea where she was going or what she was doing. Um, so she'd have to pull over and figure it out, and she'd sort of work it out. You know, I'm on my way here. This is why I'm going there. She'd get back on the road and, and get going, and the next red light, the next stop sign, she had no idea where she was going, what she was doing. Um, this may have been part of why she was late to get me from school. I don't know. Um, but I do know that, that hearing all of this really threw me because all of a sudden my memory of who she was did not match up with her memory of who she was. And I had this feeling that maybe I didn't know her at all. And I didn't know how to, how to get to her, how to understand her. And that maybe she was this much more complicated person than I'd ever really understood. So being a giant nerd, this is when I turned to science. <laughs> um, I decided that I wanted to know what had happened in her brain. And if I could figure out what had happened in her brain, I could maybe understand what she had gone through and maybe understand her better. So um, I started reading books about the brain, and I had no idea what they were talking about. And I decided I, I decided I needed some help. And I was at the time I was getting an MFA, and so I decided to take some classes. And I started at the very beginning, Mind Brain Behavior 101. It was me and 200 undergrads in this giant lecture room. And this was the first place that I learned the difference between short-term and long-term memory. Um, short-term memory being the sort of events and, and facts that we hold in our mind for just a little bit, for as long as they're useful to us. And then if any of those events or facts are, seem relevant or important or emotionally valent, we transfer them into long-term memory. Um, and this is also where I learned that long-term memory is not particularly reliable. Um, so what happens when you remember an event or when, when, an, when you have an experience, basically a, a sort of pattern of neural activity will fire to life in your brain. And when you try to remember that experience, your brain will try to recreate that same pattern of neural activity. But it won't quite get it right. And this new pattern of activity is sort of biased 
because of all of these different factors, the reason that you're trying to remember it, the mood that you're in that day, where you are, and then the next time you try and remember it, that new pattern is the one that your brain tries to call up. So in this way, memory is like a game of telephone. It's like a memory of a memory of a memory of a memory, and that original pattern of activity fades further and further into the distance. And I know that my mother had trouble with her short-term memory. So if she wasn't able to hold things in her short-term memory, she probably wasn't getting things into her long-term memory. And I'm thinking that the only person I have as my source for who she was and what she was like is kind of unreliable because there's probably holes in her memory. And I'm also thinking that the very fact of me asking her to remember things, to try and explain them to me, is warping those memories as she calls them up and her brain tries to bring up this pattern of activity. And the more that I try to remember who she was, the more I'm reaching back into my own memories to try and, and pull things out about her, the more I'm warping my own memory and my own sensation and perception of who she is. And it's like she's just receding further and further and further into the past. So this makes me turn even more to science because I can't trust myself, I can't trust her, but the brain. Like this is a thing that has facts, it's, it's this material object that people study and, and it can give me some answers. So um, I had a question actually about why her symptoms had changed over time. So I went to my neuroscience professor at the time and naive as I was, I thought that anyone who understood the brain to some degree would understand brain injury and I told her about some of these symptoms where for a while my mother couldn't read. And then she could read, but she couldn't write. And then she could write, but her handwriting had changed. It used to slant to the left, and now it slanted to the right. And she actually got a call from the bank at one point. They thought that she was someone was forging checks because her handwriting was so inconsistent. And she had to assure them that, no, 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 I, I wrote those checks. Um, and I'm explaining all of this to my neuroscience professor, and she says, did your mother have another brain injury? No. Did she have a stroke or seizures? No. Then I don't understand how her symptoms could change. And this horrified me because I thought, was she having mini seizures or something that we didn't see? You know, how much did I miss? And it wasn't until almost two years later when I was interviewing a doctor and traumatic brain injury researcher at Mount Sinai, um, that I learned that this is one of the things that's really not understood by a lot of people, and most doctors even don't know, that symptoms can change after brain injury. And this is partially because minor traumatic brain injury, which is what my mother had, which is sometimes called concussion, um, is generally includes a diffuse pattern of damage to individual neurons all across the brain. It's not like damage to one area that serves one function. Um, and this pattern of diffuse damage is dependent on where the brain is hit and how hard, or where the head is hit and how hard, and at what angle, and there's all of these sort of factors. And because every brain is unique, every human brain, and every injury or accident is unique, every brain injury is unique. This makes it incredibly difficult to study. Um, and so there's a lot of confusion around the topic. And this injury is also known as the silent injury because most conventional scanning techniques, MRI, um, CAT scans, PET scans, they can't actually image this kind of diffuse injury. So you go and you get a scan and the doctor's like, you're fine, I don't know, rest a little bit, go home, you'll be fine. And the truth is that most people are fine. After a concussion, after a minor traumatic brain injury, most people get better within weeks or sometimes months. But there's this percentage of people, 5 to 15%, it's sort of unclear how many, um, they have these really serious symptoms that continue for months or years and sometimes for the rest of their lives. And as the brain is healing or working through this damage, their symptoms can change. All of these different functions can go online and offline. Old symptoms can reappear. New symptoms can sort of pop up. And all of this is very confusing to the people around them because there's no brain scan that shows where the damage is. And there's no physical injury on their body anywhere that you can sort of point to and say, oh, you have an injury. You know, if someone has a cast or a cane, you can respond appropriately. You can offer them a chair. You can open the door. Um, you can be mindful of their injured limb. 
But when someone has a brain injury that's hidden inside the head like that, they look fine. And so you expect them to be fine. And this is very confusing and frustrating for the people around them and for the injured person themselves. Um, so I was, um, I was thinking about all of this and this thinking about memory and how it's difficult and how it's confusing and is incredibly unreliable makes me turn, of course, even more to neuroscience. And the idea that there are these little answers, right, about like these shifting symptoms makes me feel like I really can get something out of learning more about the brain. So I'm going to conferences, I'm interviewing experts, I'm uh, hanging out in research labs kind of creepily, um, and putting myself in MRI machines, <laughs> uh, volunteering for studies. And uh, a friend of mine who's in medical school asked me if um, I've ever gone to a dissection lab to hold a human brain. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you can do that? You can just go do that? And she's like, well, you know, it has to be arranged, but yeah. So that's how I found myself sneaking into a dissection lab one night. And I think, I think my friend and I had to go through a women's locker room, and I think there was a code on the door to get in. I actually don't totally remember this, but I do remember the sensation of standing in this room. I'd never seen a dead body before. And all of a sudden, I'm in this room full of cadavers on steel tables covered with these white sheets. And there's just one student in there, and he's just working on a foot that's sticking out from underneath one of these sheets. And then the lab manager comes out, and he doesn't really say anything. He just starts bringing out these glass tubs full of brain parts and whole brains and He's just piling them up in front of me, and I'm like, this is it. This is fantastic. <laughs> this is great. You know, I've, I, if I can just hold this thing, if I can just see it with my own eyes, I can finally get some answers. Like, I've come to the source of the thing itself. And so I'm standing there, and I've got, you know, these latex gloves, and they're dripping some kind of solution on the floor, and I'm holding this brain in my hands. And it's not at all like what I expected it to be. It's really heavy, and it's rubbery, and it's much more like a plant than anything animal. It's like a cauliflower, this giant rubbery cauliflower. And I'm, I'm dealing with these two sort of conflicting instincts, one of which is I literally want to rip it apart. I want to see what is inside of it. And the other is I feel like I need to treat this thing with incredible reverence and respect. Like this is this, this holy relic of some other human being's entire existence. And... I'm thinking about this, and, and this makes me think of Sunday school and this idea that the body is sacred and that repetition of that idea and how after all these years, after I don't really go to church anymore and I don't consider myself particularly religious, that idea is just sort of wired into me. And this makes me think of Hebbian learning and this idea that fire, uh, cells that fire together wire together, which is the idea that, that one cell, if it becomes active, at the same time another cell becomes active, those two become more sensitive to each other and will, are more likely to fire together in the future. And this, of course, is one of the fundamental important things about memory, about those patterns of, of activation of all of those cells firing into action at the same time together. And I'm thinking about all this, and I'm holding the brain, and I'm flipping back and forth between sort of curiosity and reverence. And it's like one of those visual illusions. You know, now you see a young woman, now you see an old woman. And I'm looking at the brain, and I think, I have no idea what I'm looking at. I do not understand how this thing works. And then I think... Nobody understands how this thing works. <laughs> if you ask a neuroscientist, they'll tell you, you know, if you ask how, how much do we know about the brain, they'll tell you we know about 0 to 5%, which is fantastic. That's why it, brain science is so exciting, because there's so much left to learn. But this thing I'm holding does not have the answers that I'm looking for. And I realized for the first time that there's this disconnect between my questions, between what I want to know about my mother and what science can tell me. And I realize that's actually okay, because one of the reasons I don't remember more from the time that I was young and from the time that my mother had this brain injury was that she actively hid her symptoms from me. She says now she didn't know then, she didn't know enough to be scared for herself, but she knew that if I knew what was happening to her, that I would be scared. And so she tried to protect me. 
And for the most part, she did. And this may be why she doesn't show up in my journals, you know, that I was able to see that something was wrong, but I couldn't name it. And I felt worried, but I didn't feel really afraid. And she did protect me, I think, from the worst of it. And this matches up perfectly with my sense of who she is, that she is one of the most loving, generous, selfless, kind people I have ever known. She is a wonderful mother. And if I don't have all the details, that's okay, because that's who she was and that's who she is. Thank you. That was Mian Christ. Mian is resident writer in biological sciences at Columbia University. Previously, she was reviews editor at The Believer, and her work has appeared in publications such as the Los Angeles Times, Lapham's Quarterly, Scientific American, and many others. She holds an MFA from Columbia University and is a founding member of New Write, a collaborative working group for scientists and writers. She is currently at work on a nonfiction book about traumatic brain injury. The story was recorded at an event produced in conjunction with Studio 360 with Kurt Anderson and was supported in part by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, and Ari Daniel Shapiro. The podcast is produced by Rose Avalith. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to The Green Space for hosting the show. To Kurt Anderson, Letal Molid, and everyone at Studio 360 for being wonderful partners. And to the time I hit my head and didn't have a traumatic brain injury. And the other time. Oh, and the one after that. Oh, and, and the other one. Thanks for listening. Pulling up to Mickey D's just for drinks? Oh yeah, that's me. Nothing extra, just perfection and a straw. Coming in hot for the coldest cups on the block. Because there are drinks. Then there are drinks from McDonald's. Mix things up with any size lemonade or sweet tea for $1.49. Perfect with our classic fries. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.